Welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast, interdisciplinary conversations about new works in the broad world of business research. I'm your host, Andrew Jennings. If you like what you hear today, please consider subscribing to the podcast or sharing with others who might like it too. And if you have ideas for future episodes, let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Our guest today is Don Nagy, professor of law at the Indiana University Maurer School of Law. We'll be discussing her article, Chiarella versus United States, and its indelible impact on insider trading law, which is forthcoming in the Tennessee Journal of Law and Policy. I'll add a link to the article in the show notes for today's episode. Donna, welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thank you, Andrew. Lovely to be here. Donna, your article is a case study on the first criminal prosecution for insider trading. And before we start to talk about that case, I wondered if you can maybe give our listeners just a, a real quick background of what insider trading is, uh, what is the legal basis for its prohibition, and what was maybe the state of play with insider trading law at the time that Mr. Chiarella was indicted for violating it? Here in the United States, we have no express statutory prohibition of the offense of insider trading. So if we think of insider trading as purchasing or selling securities on the basis of material non-public information, unlike just about every other country with a developed securities market, in the United States, you can't go to the U.S. code and find an express statutory prohibition of insider trading. Instead, what we have is a broad anti-fraud prohibition. Congress in 1934 enacted the Exchange Act. Section 10B of the Exchange Act makes it unlawful to commit fraud in connection with the purchase or sale of securities in violation of an SEC rule. And so Section 10B gives the SEC rulemaking authority. And the SEC has adopted um, in the 1940s Rule 10B-5, which makes it unlawful to engage in fraud in connection with the purchase or sale of securities. So insider trading in the United States is unlawful insofar as it is a fraud to determine what constitutes a fraud. Federal courts typically look to the common law of fraud. So that is how insider trading is illegal here in the U.S. To look at the case of Chiarella, it's covered in any securities regulation class, what makes the case special? What happened in it? Who are some of the players? And what was the law that we ultimately got from the Supreme Court in that case? Um, sure. Chiarella was decided by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1980. And so maybe I'll back up to the 1960s, actually even before that. So at one time, the idea of a officer or director or an insider of a corporation using the corporation's information for personal profit. In some jurisdictions, it was viewed as a breach of fiduciary duty. Not necessarily even a majority of jurisdictions at common law, that is under state law, but there certainly was a healthy minority of states that viewed it as a breach of duty when a director or officer used a corporation's information in a transaction with the shareholders of that corporation. Now, in those jurisdictions that recognize this as a breach of fiduciary duty, it did so in the context of a one-on-one -on -one securities transaction. And so an officer or a director who was engaged directly in the purchase or sale of a securities from a particular shareholder of the company. Even in the states that recognized insider trading as a breach of fiduciary duty, 
those states did not go even further and say that stock market insider trading, when an officer and director would sell shares or purchase shares over, let's say, the New York Stock Exchange, most jurisdictions did not regard that as a breach of duty because trading on stock markets is anonymous. You don't know who you are purchasing from or who you are selling to. In 1961, then, the Securities and Exchange Commission, in an administrative action, brought a lawsuit arguing that a purchase or sale over a stock exchange defrauds the persons on the other side of that transaction. And so it's the In re Caddy Roberts decision. It was an SEC administrative decision where we have this idea that stock market insider trading is unlawful and a violation of this broad anti-fraud rule, Rule 10b-5. Then in the late 1960s, the Securities and Exchange Commission sued officers and directors of the Texas Gulf Sulphur Company. These offices and directors had possession of very good news for the corporation um, that there was a discovery of an ore strike, very valuable minerals in land that the corporation owned. And the officers and directors used that information before it was made public and purchased securities the expected belief that the stock price was going to rise. The Securities and Exchange Commission sued these officers and directors in federal court, and the Southern District of New York, affirmed by the Second Circuit, found that these officers and directors had engaged in securities fraud in violation of Rule 10b-5. In making that decision, the Second Circuit had grounded its holding in what it considered the justifiable expectation of the investing public that markets uh, would in relatively equal access to information. And so in the Texas Gulf Sulphur case, the Second Circuit had articulated a very broad sounding prohibition that seemed to ground Rule 10b-5 in equal access to information. This idea that keeping silent about material non-public information in a securities transaction defrauded the individuals on the other side of this transaction because of this equal access idea. So that was the state of the law then going into the Chiarella case. Chiarella started as an SEC judicial action, that is, the Securities and Exchange Commission filed a complaint against Chiarella for violating Rule 10b-5, and that civil complaint was settled uh, without Chiarella admitting or denying liability. So leading up to the decision by the Southern District of New York and the DOJ to bring a criminal case against Chiarella, you went really deep into the history of this case. You conducted an oral history interviewing some of the key players. What did you learn about the ins and outs of the case from talking to these people who were really responsible on the defense side and on the, the government side for developing this first insider trading criminal prosecution? Sure. So as you mentioned, Andrew, Chiarella versus United States is case basically in every securities regulation case book. Most professors who teach corporations also teach the case. And so it's very memorable. So before talking about the individual lawyers in the case of which uh, there's lots to learn uh, from them, it would probably be useful to just talk a little bit about the facts of the Chiarella case. Case. So I've mentioned that the Securities and Exchange Commission brought and settled a Rule 10b-5 fraud action. So the case, the facts are actually pretty simple. Vincent Chiarella was a financial printer, and so he worked for Pandic Press. He was the markup man, and so these are in the days prior to computers where corporate documents were typeset at a printing press. 
And so Pandic Press, uh, which was a big printer in New York City, was hired by investment banks and law firms to print documents, including documents for merger transactions and Uh, hostile takeovers in the form of tender offers. Then working with these printing documents, Chiarella was able to effectively decode um, some names of the target companies. So the custom in the industry was to basically give pseudonyms or code names to both the acquiring company and the target company to preserve the confidentiality right until the night of the final printing. But through other information in these documents, Chiarella was able to decode the target companies. He was able to purchase stock then using this confidential information that he had by virtue of his employment relationship. And he used that information then to buy stock in the target. When the tender offers were announced, the stock price rose substantially and Chiarella then very soon after, almost immediately, sold his tender offer stock at a substantial premium. And he made just over $30,000 in profits, five different transactions for which he was charged. And so the idea was that Chiarella defrauded the shareholders of the target corporation by staying silent about the material facts that he knew and they did not know. So that was what the SEC settled. Um, The SEC settled the Rule 10b-5 complaint with Chiarella. Uh, Chiarella consented to an injunction, which meant he promised uh, never to do this again, and he was ordered to disgorge his profit in the amount of, as I said, about $30,000. So that was in 1977, May of 1977, the SEC announced the settlement with Chiarella. Insider trading, while it's a civil offense, a violation of Rule 10b-5, can also be prosecuted criminally. And so the U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York heard about the settlement with the SEC and Chiarella and opted then to bring a criminal proceeding. And so Chiarella was indicted in January 1978, and he then was tried in front of a jury and convicted of uh, the crime of insider trading. In your article, you interview defense counsel, uh, you interview Uh, the line prosecutors and the folks in the Solicitor General's office. What did you learn about the case and how it developed that maybe isn't in the securities regulation case books? Yes. And so uh, that had always, so Chiarella is a case that I've probably taught twice a year for the 25 years that I've been in teaching. And so one of the questions that always fascinated me is how did a settlement with the Securities and Exchange Commission for less than $30,000 essentially morph into the very first criminal prosecution. Um, What was it that prompted the U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York, the assistant U.S. attorney who presented the indictment to the grand jury that sparked that prosecution? Let me talk about a few key players. So it was John Lowe who presented the case to the grand jury. The U.S. attorney at the time was Robert Fisk, and John Sifford was the assistant U.S. attorney who actually tried the case before the jury and obtained the conviction. Um, And so each of them had a role in how and why Chiarello was prosecuted in the way that he did. I should back up here and say that Vincent Chiarello was not the first 
financial printer who encountered the scrutiny of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Prior to Chiarella, there had been three other cases involving financial printers where individual employees would, just like Chiarella, have taken the information, the confidential information that they came across in their employment and used it for personal profit in securities trading. Among a number of interviews that I did for this paper, I did a telephone interview with Robert Fisk. He went on as after a tremendous career as U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York. He joined the firm of Davis Polk and is retired counsel, but a very, very well-known defense side white collar practitioner for decades. And so I asked him, what was the motivation in charging Chiarella? And what he had said to me, because he remembered the case very distinctly, is that he was aware of the other SEC settlements against financial printers prior to Chiarella. And it seemed to him that financial printers were not being adequately deterred from using confidential client customer employment relationship for their personal profit in securities trading. I mentioned before that in the settlement with Chiarella, the Securities and Exchange Commission sought an injunction and an order of disgorgement. And Robert Fisk had come to the conclusion that that was not adequate deterrent. U.S. Attorney Fisk was also aware that the printing industry had publicized these prior settlements with the workforce, that there were signs in the workplace that made clear that using customer information for personal profit was a violation of the law and could subject individuals who chose to do so to not only civil liability, but criminal liability as well. And so in Fisk's view, criminal prosecution was warranted because Chiarella had used the customer information, notwithstanding such overwhelmingly powerful notice of the consequences. And at the time, very few other segments of the financial industry, um, apart from the printing industry, uh, had made this unmistakably clear to its workforce. Um, And so it seemed that printing industry was one where there was very clear notice of the potentially severe consequences from insider trading. Therefore, making the prosecution against Chiarella, the criminal prosecution against Chiarella, fair and just. What does the story of Chiarella and what does the oral history that you put together as part of writing this article teach us about how the law of insider trading emerged? And maybe what does it teach us about the role of lawyering in the development of the path of the law? Sure. And I can here give some examples. So what the Supreme Court did in the Chiarella case in 1980 was essentially adopted what we think of today as the classical theory of insider trading. The Supreme Court rejected this equal access approach to insider trading that I mentioned before in the Texas Gulf Sulphur Second Circuit opinion. And so in the Chiarella versus United States Supreme Court holding, Justice Lewis Powell for a majority of the court held that silence is not misleading absent a duty to disclose. And the duty to disclose in the insider trading context comes from the existence of a fiduciary-like relationship between the securities trader 
and the shareholders of the issuing corporation. Chiarella did not have that relationship with the target company. Recall, I said that Chiarella worked for the financial printer who was hired by the acquiring companies. So Chiarella stood as a stranger to the shareholders of the issuing corporation. That to the Supreme Court meant that Chiarella had not defrauded shareholders in violation of Rule 10b-5. And so the Supreme Court then reversed Chiarella's conviction. What Conducting interviews with the attorneys who litigated and prosecuted and defended Chiarella shows us is how they themselves developed some of these arguments. So Stanley Arkin was the attorney in private practice who represented Vincent Chiarella. Stanley Arkin defended Chiarella in the Southern District of New York during the trial and argued the case up to the Supreme Court. And if we look at the litigation briefs in the Chiarella case presented to the Second Circuit, presented to the Supreme Court, we actually see that it was Stanley Arkin who set out this fiduciary nexus type interpretation of Rule 10b-5. So whereas Justice Powell for a majority of the Supreme Court established the so-called classical theory of insider trading, It was the creativity of a litigator, Stanley Arkin, that basically carved out a pathway by which the Supreme Court could explain the ruling in the Texas Gulf Sulphur case without extending that beyond officers, directors, employees of the issuing corporation. So that is one example where we see that the lawyering and the advocacy involved basically successfully persuaded a majority of the Supreme Court to adopt that as as a legal theory. And indeed, the reason that Chiarella is such a famous case is because the Supreme Court's framing of insider trading as requiring this fiduciary-like relationship between the parties to the securities transaction is not only the state of the law then in 1980, but continues up to the present day. Donna, what key takeaways would you like our listeners to have from this conversation and from the article? And are there any future projects you'd like to pursue in this vein? Sure. So I've mentioned um, the incredibly effective lawyering of uh, John Sifford, who was the trial attorney. Another key takeaway from the research and from the paper is the impact that individual lawyers can have on the development of law. And here I can veer off a little bit and point to, for example, now Judge Frank Easterbrook who at the time as Chiarella was being argued to the Supreme Court was the Deputy Solicitor General. Frank Easterbrook uh, had left the Solicitor General's office to join the University of Chicago as a law professor But the advocacy that Judge Easterbrook brought to the Chiarella case is incredibly fascinating as well. So working with other attorneys in the Solicitor General's office, Easterbrook helped develop what essentially became the misappropriation theory of insider trading. The idea that someone who steals information is defrauding the source of that information by using it and remaining silent in a securities transaction. So Andrew, you ask about takeaways. I think as we look at the various attorneys who intersected with the Chiarella case, we see how important their advocacy was, how their own creativity, how their own way of looking at securities markets, their own views in terms of market efficiency in the case of Frank Easterbrook at the time, really led to the development of 
important monumental securities doctrine. And so it's a story about how individual lawyers and their effective arguments can really shape the law on the ground and the law on the ground for decades to come. Our guest today has been Donna Nagy, professor of law at the Indiana University Maurer School of Law. We've discussed her article, Chiarella versus United States, and its indelible impact on insider trading law, which is forthcoming in the Tennessee Journal of Law and Policy. I'll add a link to the article in the show notes for today's episode. Donna, thank you for joining the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thank you so much, Andrew. It was a real pleasure. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Business Scholarship Podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider subscribing to the podcast or leaving a rating on your favorite podcast app, or let other people know about it too. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm your host, Andrew Jennings.